there we go. I, I knew it wasn't doing it right. Okay, because if I record to the cloud, I get um, closed captioning at some point. <clears throat> so, um, like I said, when you're creating your program uh, for for this class, for your programs, you're always going to have these three things at the first the, uh, the first three lines of your program. So, um, remember, it's not my name; it's your name. Okay. I reiterate that, and that's just from 20 years of teaching experience, okay? <laughs> so I know people go, this Peter Watson, what's next? This, right? Uh, then we do have to have a remark here. So we do have to have a remark. Now, it's not going to be SETI program. It's going to be a trip cost uh, calculator, <clears throat> the trip cost calculator, and then give me a description of what the program does, basically. So if somebody says, um, Whenever you get confused about what a remark should be, my advice is always just pretend that I am looking over your shoulder and I ask you, well, what does this program do? And then you remark it, right? That's your answer would be what the answer would be. So um, what's the trip cost calculator do? Uh, well, it, and you have to be a little bit more detailed. You can't just be, well, it calculates the trip cost. Um, <clears throat> because we do have some input, so we have to be a little bit more specific. So we do have to say something like, um, you know, takes the distance traveled uh, miles per gallon and cost per gallon and calculates the total trip cost of a trip. And that's what the program does, right? So um, I don't know, we're all human beings, we can all come up with that a little bit differently. Um, but there you go. Uh, we only really need to do this kind of thing when we are using identifiers that aren't spelled out. So there's a section in the book about identifiers. And basically what an identifier is, it's the name of a literal or a variable, what we name it. So when we create it, Right, we're, we're actually not creating the memory spot, we are reserving the memory spot so that we can use it. And <clears throat> when we reserve that memory spot, we give it a name. And there are certain naming conventions. Again, I refer you back to the book because I don't want to spend too much time on it right now. But naming things a, a little bit in a little bit more detail or a little bit more descriptively is better because then I can, if I'm looking at the program, I can see if you name the variable, say, for where you're going to hold the distance that the user input, uh, distance traveled, then you don't really need a line of code describing what distance traveled holds, what it's being used for, because it says distance traveled. Um, I said that you could use MPG because I assume that we all know what MPG means. And I think in this country, we're fairly safe that, that most people, I, I would bet money that if I ask you what my, uh, MPG means, that you would say miles per gallon. So, you know, you can use that as a name. <coughs> and cost per gallon, uh, cost per gallon is a little bit tricky because, you know, what does... Uh, CPG mean, right? So just using CPG, uh, I don't know. So you may have to remark that. And by the way, sometimes when we create um, our variables, our memory, well, we, like I said, reserve our memory spots, uh, we may want to remark those if they're a little bit weird. <clears throat> so sometimes if we have a lot, we just do it all at the beginning. <clears throat> Um, sometimes if you just have, like, if you were going to use CPG, you can actually add a remark over here next to a line of code. So to the right of a line of code, not just at the top. So I could do this. And I never do the spaces. I, I'm not used to it yet. 
Um, so there should be a space between the number sign and the actual remark. So here now, obviously, you know, this is P equals, but if this said CPG, right, equals blah, 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 then I could remark it if I was using CPG, or I could just use, write out cost per gallon. Remember, no spaces in names. Does that make sense to everybody? I don't want to lose anybody by being vague. Yes, no, maybe, anybody? Can you hear me? <clears throat> no, nobody can hear me? We can yes. When it, um, okay. Uh, when it comes to like labeling these and it's something that we understand, can we do like cost PG since we know that we're figuring out stuff with gallons? Like, oh, okay, so here's the thing. It's not that you understand it. It's that somebody else looking at your code understands it. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I vaguely talked about how in the real world, um, programming is typically not done by one person, but by a group of people who then share their code. And then other programmers are gonna look at your code. So that's what all this stuff is for. And basically, I know it's redundant in here, but when we start learning how to program, we learn with all of the good habits. So we create habits. And all programming classes are trying to get you to, be a, to become a programmer, whether you do or not, is irrelevant. So we're, we're, we're practicing habits over and over again so that we do things over and over again. In this case, it's good to be a lemming. We do stuff over and over the same way, no matter what kind of program we're creating. And that gives us a habit and those habits, um, we just use whether somebody else is gonna look at our code or not. We just use those habits over and over again. And the reason is, there's so many ways to make mistakes when you're creating a program. And so if you tend to follow into a rhythm, a uh, organized kind of pattern of how you write your code and, and, and you do it over and over again, you minimize the, mis the mistakes of sloppiness. Uh, hopefully that, that it, it probably doesn't make sense, but trust me, it, it's true. Um, if you, if you work the same, that's why they're like four steps. You work the same four steps over and over again, um, if you need all four steps. But you go through it and you remark it and you, you know, look at it. And that keeps us from getting scatterbrained. Um, another problem with programming is we tend to be very, we all have, what is it, attention deficit disorder a little bit, uh, especially in our modern world. Uh, where we talked about, you know, being distracted all the time and so much information coming in. When we're trying to focus, <clears throat> it used to be it, it, not that difficult because people were able to focus on stuff because they didn't have this world where we had all of this information constantly being, uh, that we're being bombarded with. And so it was a lot easier for people to focus in the past. But nowadays it's a little bit, it's, it's harder for us to just sit down and concentrate without being distracted by a million different things going on around us in our environment. And so patterns help us focus. So if we do the same steps, that's a pattern, right? The same steps over and over again, they become second nature. And we kind of go, okay, did I finish all of this? Then I can worry about the next bit. Did I do all of that stuff? Then I can worry about the next bit. And so when we're creating programs that in, in programming languages that are a little bit more complicated where you're creating a user interface or something else, you know, you go through the steps and that way you are pretty much think you're, I'm done with step one, whatever that step might be. I'm done with it. I don't have to worry about it. Step two, what's that? And so it's a way for us to focus. And here, right? I'm displaying my welcome. That's the first step. So I'm going to get that out of the way. So again, it's a little bit of this is what the program is. Now, this is for the user, right? The first bit is just remarks. This stuff is those are just remarks. 
they're in our code, the user isn't going to see those. <clears throat> but here, where I display actually display the welcome, I'm just doing some print lines. And I'm just telling people what the program is. Right, and maybe some simple instructions on how to use it. It's not functional, it's informative for the user. The one thing that's very difficult in, well, there's a whole bunch of stuff that's difficult when we're programming, but one of the things is trying to split that split personality. I think I talked about it before, where we have to be the programmer and the end user. And so when we're creating the program, we are the programmer. And because we are creating the program, we kind of know how it should be used because we're creating it. I don't know if that makes sense. When you create a program, you know exactly how it should be used and why it should be used that way. Because it makes logical sense to us when we're programming it, creating it. Uh, the user, on the other hand, has no idea and doesn't care why it was programmed the way it was. They just want to be able to use it. So they have no idea about how to use it correctly. So basically that little welcome, you know, you should say welcome to the trip cost calculator. Um, and then you should have a, a sentence or two about how to use it, what it does. It calculates the trip, this program will let you calculate the trip cost uh, <clears throat> for a certain distance. Uh, please enter, you know, distance, uh, miles per gallon, and cost per gallon. And, and because we used, we said we were going to use float variables for everything, you could probably write a line that says something like, you may use decimals, uh, decimal data type, uh, decimal, uh, you may use numeric values in decimal form or integer form, or you can use whole numbers or decimals. Right, because that's a bit of information that the user wouldn't know. Because they don't know whether we created float variables or uh, integer variables. And they actually probably don't even know what an integer variable or a float variable is. They don't care, it doesn't matter to them. <coughs> so that's step one, we get that out of the way. Again, it doesn't really have any uh, programming value. It doesn't actually do anything or help us uh, program. I'm going to take my watch off so I can put it down. <clears throat> put it next to my. There we go. I'll glance at it every once in a while. I have my toolbar so that it hides automatically. So in order for me to see the time, I have to scroll down. What time is it? 21. 21. Hey, my watch is working. I have mechanical watches, so. I have to adjust them every once in a while. <clears throat> so hopefully that makes sense. Then we get on to the user input. So again, with our trip calculator, we have, um, and again, I remark that section of code, right? So the next section of code that I have is here. Now I'm only gonna, we're only gonna have three user inputs, right? And they're gonna be float variables. So this is going to say float, and this is going to say distance, and then it's going to say, please enter the distance traveled in miles. Also important, right? This is, or it, will it work for kilometers? No, it will not. So somewhere we should probably mention that it's for miles per gallon. So if you're in Canada, you're screwed. They use, they use liters and kilometers in Canada? I think they do. I'm not sure, actually. Canada has a bit of a hybrid system. Roberto, what happened? What's going on? Um, some of us just got kicked from this actual meeting and were sent to like a different Zoom meeting. And we just thought that you lost connection, but apparently it was fine on your guys' end. Was I okay? I like your microphone, by the way, Patrick. You look very professional. You look like you're in a studio. It's actually relatively inexpensive. 
I have one. I, I have a couple of mics actually. Um, but you even have the little um, adjust the boom. You have a boom. It's awesome. Um, <clears throat> yeah, uh, mics aren't that that expensive. Um, you can get a decent vocal mic. He, he's got the the big foam thing on the top too, but you can get a decent vocal mic um, for speaking for twenty thirty bucks. It's not that expensive. Your boom probably cost as much as the mic. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, Patrick is ready to podcast. That's right. Let's not get started about cassettes and mixtapes. Um, since that's what I've been doing recently is making mixtapes. <clears throat> I've decided to go all analog, but that's a whole nother topic for a whole different day. I'm going back to my roots. Um, <clears throat> so there are two meeting rooms. That's awesome. How many people are in here? Um, the participants, 62. No, I got pretty much everybody. Um, okay, so... Anyway, uh, I'm sorry. I apologize for the weird Zoomness. Um, I didn't see anything weird, and um, I don't think I think most people were okay. Uh, so, but anyway, uh, so we're here in input, and you can go back and watch the five minutes that uh, you were kicked out. Uh, here we would have something like distance uh, traveled in miles, right? Now remember, miles is important. I was we were talking about how when we describe the do the welcome that we're really describing the program uh, because the user doesn't know, right? So and and um, I know in Mexico they use liters and and uh, and kilometers. So right, this program isn't really good for people in Mexico because we'd have to work it differently. Now we have three lines of input for our program and none of them are integer data types. I said we're going to use all floats, right? <clears throat> and we're not going to have P, N, and F. We're going to actually have good identifiers. Then we just do the math and remember that there are two lines of math. One is, well, depending on how you do it, right? It's either two lines or one line. Um, but <clears throat> we would create, I would, the way I would do it is I would do two lines and I would just do um, gallons used equals, um, what would I do? The uh, distance divided by miles per gallon. And then I would make my trip cost equal to what is it? Gallons used times uh, cost per gallon. And now I have in my trip cost variable, the answer, right? It's a calculated value. It's a variable that was created. And remember, there's a difference between user input and calculated values. Anytime we want a program to be able to remember a number, whether that number comes from the user typing something, or it comes from us, the result of doing a calculation of some sort, uh, you know, we have a variable that we're using, a memory spot. And so uh, we don't assign values to gallons used if you're using that variable, or you could just do trip cost equals um, uh, distance divided by miles per gallon in parentheses times um, cost per gallon. Is that right? I think so. Um, equals trip cost. But, you know, trip cost, there's no, there's no input for trip cost. It's a calculated value. So we're not asking, if, the, if we were asking the user what's the trip cost, then why are they using the program? Because that's what it's going to calculate. And then, so we do the calculations or calculation, and then we just display our results. And remember that you don't need to do the round here. That's a function where they're uh, getting rid of the decimals. Uh, we should do a format. And we talked about formatting, right? Uh, so we could do 
a format number of uh, uh, trip cost, and then we would use the dot two F to force two decimal places because we're doing dollars and cents. And then you test your program. It should it should work. So there's my recap of the trip cost calculator. And I'm only using the Drake equation here because um, it's similar. Actually, all programs are similar because they have the same four bits. Display the welcome, get user input, assign values to variables, calculate the results, display the results. I mean, there are four bits that are going on here. So does that make sense to everybody? Yes, maybe. Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. So, are there any other questions? Uh, I have a question, Professor, but uh -huh. it's more, it may be dumb, but I no. know there's like 70 plus of us probably in this class. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know. I'm sure I'm not the only one who's new to this stuff, but my program yeah. works and mm -hmm. i have ran it but yes. the thing is like do we have to make so i noticed that when i divide by zero it kind of combusts on itself yeah it, it's going to throw an error because you're not allowed to divide by zero but we haven't got to the spot where we can um do uh error checking oh uh, i see yeah because i have a um uh, i have family that does this stuff so i sent mm -hmm. them my program and he was like oh it, it, it kind of dies when you, <laughs> when you yeah no uh, why does it die because you're not allowed to divide by zero so right? it would just you yeah so yeah. if you do um let's see what's the division uh it's distance by miles per gallon so if you do zero miles per gallon right your program is going to blow up mm -hmm. yeah um well, how often is how often is that going to happen Oh, it should never. Who gets zero miles per gallon, right? Yeah. If you get zero miles per gallon, you didn't go anywhere. <laughs> so I was, yeah, I guess the main thing I'm just curious is like, do we need to cover all ends of this or? No. Okay. No, you, you only need to cover what I tell you. So um, in this case, we haven't talked about, and the book hasn't talked about um, checking uh, for uh, proper input uh, and, and how to deal with improper input. Since we haven't talked about it, you don't need to implement it. Uh, just don't run the program with, with zeros as your miles per gallon. And uh, you know what? In the real world, okay, so here's the rule. It's going to sound weird. As when we're in programmer mode, we need to think of all end users as being completely stupid. Okay. Completely dumb. And what that means is that if there is a way to screw up um, the program, they will do it. Okay. Now, to us, entering a zero for miles per gallon doesn't seem like it would happen ever. Again, because it doesn't make any logical sense. Because if I think about it, if I have a car that gets zero miles per gallon, I'm never driving it anywhere. <laughs> because no, much, no matter how much gasoline I put into it, it gets zero miles per gallon. So it doesn't drive anywhere. It just sits there. I can turn it on, but it doesn't go anywhere. I guess if you had a car that had no wheels on it, um, that car would get zero miles per gallon, right? It's up on blocks. You can get in it, you can turn it on, and it runs, and you can blast the air conditioner and listen to the radio, and there you go, and you can pretend you're driving, um, but you're getting zero miles per gallon. So it, 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 it's probably not something that, it, nobody's gonna go, ooh, I wonder how much it costs to sit in my driveway for two hours. Um, <laughs> right? That's not a trip cost. That's just a, that's nonsense. Um, but a user would probably at some point want, somebody would enter zero and cause the program to crash. 
And then um, typically, <clears throat> that's called an exception, by the way, in programming, when uh, the program uh, crashes or does something that's illegal, that it's not allowed to do. For instance, dividing by zero is illegal, right? The answer is not zero, it's NA. Or no, what is it? Um, undefined or actually we're just there there is no answer because we're not allowed to divide by zero. It's like a rule in math. You're not allowed to. I could never figure out why. Um, but anyway, um, I'm not a mathematician. <clears throat> so we don't have to do that. Any other questions? I don't want to I gotta um, yeah, don't get a blue, don't get a USB mic. Is that a USB mic? Uh, I can't hear you because um, you have to, you have to press the space key 15 times. This is a USB mic. However, the back of the microphone itself is XLR, which is the big three pin like you'll find in a studio. Yeah. So it's, it has it's, a USB it has a USB converter on it, but how how's the sound quality? Is is it? Oh sound no, it's quality? excellent. It's excellent. Yeah, but it, that's because it's not a USB mic. Correct. Correct. It, it is it's actually a, a studio mic that's been converted to USB. Exactly. So you can plug it into a USB port. Yes, and that's what I meant when I said don't buy a hardwired USB mic. Typically, they are cheaply made, although the Blue Yetis are very good um, as far as USB mics go. Um, there are much better mics um, out there. Uh, I have a Blue Snowball USB. Yeah, are you using it right now? Yeah. Yeah, you sound like you're a million miles away. Because I am, my microphone is pretty far away. Because <laughs> <laughs> so it sounds very lifelike then. Yes. So that's great. Um, no, I, um, <sighs> okay, I have a musician's background, so um, I know a bit about mics. Um, so in general, and I'm, I'm not saying, you can buy a, a better mic for the same price as a USB only mic is basically what I'm trying to say. And in general, uh, USB mics are, <sighs> they're overpriced. And the reason is, is because people want to use them and plug them into their computer. And it's a, because everybody's at home, it's one of those COVID-19 things. Right now, USB mics are very expensive because that's what people want. They just want to plug it in, right? And so um, it's just like hand sanitizer costs like $7 for a bottle. It, it's like, you know, 25 masks cost $25. Um, if you ever, ever looked at masks before that, you could buy 50 for like six, seven bucks. Um, now a 50 pack is, you know, 40 bucks. So uh, prices have started to come down a little bit as people have stock, but still it's very expensive. So USB um, mics are one of those phenomena right now. Um, and you can get better quality mics for cheaper and just use a conversion plug. Because if it has a real mic input on the back end, it's designed or built for people who are real mic users who are going to a PA system. Um, <clears throat> and that will work really well for a, a USB setup too. But anyway. Um, I don't know. How is my mic, by the way, since I'm using the computer? Do I sound? You have no idea how I sound in real life. But... Um, Again, Patrick, you're not unmuted. <laughs> it's like four times four presses. It's a little tinny. Mm -hmm. um, uh, not a lot, but it's a little tinny. It's easy. It's easy to hear what you're saying. However, okay. if you were trying to transmit music, it would probably be unacceptable. Yeah, no, and then that's not what this is for. 
This is for me, it, you know, speaking mics are a little bit different and, and I'm not doing a radio broadcast. Um, I don't have the voice for it. Uh, Patrick's voice is better. He's got a deeper kind of grittier voice than mine. He, he's better when you're on the radio. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, headphones, your voice sounds different versus my Chromebook audio. Yes, obviously, um, output is also important. So the speakers that you are listening to me on uh, is going to affect what I sound like. So if you have headphones on, it probably sounds better because most of our speakers uh, on our laptops or our computers are crap that if they're built in, they're little teeny crappy things that don't cost very much. Um, <clears throat> even the little cheap you know, things that you kind of stand on the side that you can plug in, those sound better. And the, really the, the only reason is because the speakers are bigger. Um, so uh, mine sounds okay, <clears throat> but they're just little teeny tiny speakers. They can't be bigger than that. Can't be bigger than a quarter because they're here. But anyway, so uh, any other questions? Are we gonna have lab today, like either to like look over if like yes. other people want to like run their modules, so, like we mm -hmm. can check. Oh, okay. So if if you have um yeah we'll 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 have lab and we'll we'll uh, I'll let you guys uh, ask me questions again and show me stuff if you have issues because there were a couple of people that had issues. Um, I don't know if they got resolved, but we can go over that in lab. Okay, so let me talk about um <laughs> let me talk about something new. Um, <clears throat> and it's not really new, but I want to start with, um, oh, hello, what are you doing? I'm just getting wrapping paper. Oh, okay. Uh, let me start about with variable assignment and keyboard input. Uh, and one of the things that I, I don't think I mentioned is that typically when we, uh, there are two ways to get input. One way would be like this, and, and I, I, need to, I need you to understand. You can see the book, right? So here, I have an input line, right, that says input, how many credits do you have? So the user is going to type in, you know, 52. And the equal sign puts that into a variable called line. Now, here's what's important to understand here. The line variable, by default, is a string variable. And the reason that it's a string variable is because I haven't defined it as something else. Okay? So, does that make sense? Because the whole thing is going to hinge on you understanding that. A string variable is built to hold characters. And a character or characters are not numbers. So you can see here in the, I've, they've created this line variable, but then what they've done is they've taken the line variable, converted it to an integer value, and then put that value into this number of credits um, variable. And the reason that they've done that here is because they want to do a calculation, or I think they, they want to do a calculation with the number of credits. And you cannot do calculations with string variables. They do the same thing here. What is your grade point average with an input line? And this is a string variable. And so they convert the string variable to a float and put it into a new variable. Now, um, you can use GPA or line in a calculation. And the reason is this. So here's the crux of this. Um, where's my share? 
and I don't remember whether we did this or not, <clears throat> if this is input and held as a string variable, then this would be uh, read as 582. It's individual characters next to each other. If it's held in a string variable, that's 582. And you can't multiply 582 by 34. If this is converted to a float or an integer data type, then it becomes 582. Because then we are forcing the, the ones, the tens, the hundreds places, the way we read numeric values. Right? A numeric value, the two here represents two ones. The eight represents eight tens. The eight is actually 80, right? And the five is five one hundredths, one hundreds, not one hundredths, one hundreds. So when I read this five hundred, right, I'm actually doing a multiplication. It's five times a hundred, five hundred. Eighty, that's eight times ten. And two is two times one. When I look at this as a string variable, then that's five eight two. The five is not related to, and by the way, it's not related to ones either. It's not related to any number. This is a character. So for instance, if you have a phone number, my chat room's in the way, sorry. If I have a phone number like that, right? You, you can't do math with a phone number. And we don't read this. Uh, if somebody asks you what your phone number is and you say 5,826,565, the person that you're telling the fo your phone number to like that is gonna go, what? Huh? And the next thing they're gonna say is that, never mind, I don't need to be your friend, you're weird. <laughs> right? Because nobody says that. Because there are no ones, tens, hundreds, thousands, ten thousands, um, hundred thousands, millions associated with these numbers. They're just characters. So that's what we need to understand. You need to understand that there's a difference between um, numeric values and string variables uh, or string values. And you cannot multiply or do mathematics with string variables. Now, in, oh, I, I need to share my second screen, I'm sorry. There we go. With, and then everything moves around on my screen again. There, now, perfect. <clears throat> Better. <clears throat> Instead of doing two lines like this, sorry, I can't get two lines to highlight, there we go. Instead of doing two lines, assigning it to a string and then converting the string into a numeric value, we just use this integer or float and then in parentheses do input and write in parentheses ask the question. So we do it all in one line. That way we don't have to do a value assignment and then a conversion and then do math. Does that make sense? Is that clear? So we basically would just do this, right? Let me scroll. Instead of doing it in two, in two lines of code, you just do it all at once. And the only thing that you need to be careful of is the parentheses there and there. Now, 
in 2.23, um, what is an identifier? An identifier is the name that we give the value. We've already talked about the, the memory spot. And by the way, whether it's a literal or a, or a variable, it doesn't matter. Um, it talks about what is a valid identifier. So here it talks about our naming conventions. Um, total sales, sales for 2010. You cannot start a, so these are invalid here. Uh, you can't start variables with a number or an underscore. Um, you can't have spaces in variable names. Uh, you can't put quotation marks around a name. Um, so these are valid names. I tend to do capitals at the beginning and not just at the, the second sentence, uh, second word if I have multiple words. So I will do a capital at the beginning um, if I have multiple words, but that's just habit. Um, so yeah, um, so the, the book talks about keywords. So there are some words that you cannot use for naming things uh, because they do stuff. <laughs> okay, so uh, here's a list of words that are reserved as actual, they do something, uh, or they are a word that's reserved for a particular kind of thing. Like float, for instance, you shouldn't name a variable float because float means decimal, right? And we use float as a, um, to define the data type of a variable. And so you shouldn't name, you shouldn't have it, it shouldn't be float equals, you know, uh, float input, blah, blah, blah. Hopefully that makes sense. Uh, so there's a bunch here that you can't use or you shouldn't use. Actually, some of them you can't use, it'll cause your program to crash. Others you just shouldn't use because you're not supposed to. Um, what time is it? Damn it, I wanted to get to arithmetic operators today. Um, maybe I'll have to do that at the beginning of lab. What time is it? The time is 50. Yeah, I'm going to have to do that at the beginning of lab. So I'm going to talk about operators uh, and yeah, I'm going to talk about operators uh, and maybe operator precedence. So basically that means order of operations at the beginning of, of our lab. And then um, we'll talk about um, whatever it is that you want to talk about. Okay, so having said that,